soil would be a flourishing of vegetation growth. <laughs> One report refers to CO2 in this context as a fertilizer. That's pretty good. I'm also aware that our esteemed Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu, yes, a Nobel Prize winner but not in climatology, is running around giving lectures stating that if our planet reaches 450 parts per million CO2 concentration, the world essentially comes to an end. <laughs> I'm, aware of any, um, I'm unaware of any scientist willing to defend that position, but this guy is Secretary of Energy. Perhaps Senator Kerry's truth squad could help. And while we're at it, how about adding Dr. Carlin's report on the Kerry website? Back to the politics. In conversations with a couple of senators recently, they expressed the thought that the cap and trade legislation must be refuted on economic grounds, and the economic grounds are serious. Mm -hmm. According to a review by the Chamber of Commerce, an organization under fire for its call for more scientific clarity, the House bill promulgates 397 new regulations and 1,060 mandates on industry. Speaking of my good friends at the Chamber, you probably noticed that um, <coughs> Apple dropped out of the Chamber this morning. Now, I wonder why Apple dropped out of the Chamber. Let's see, let's look at their board of directors. Well, oh, that's interesting. Al Gore's there. How inconvenient. <laughs> Over 400 pages of the bill are devoted to the cap and trade requirements alone. It's tantamount to the federal government taking over the energy industry as well. I believe the bill should be refuted on both scientific and economic grounds because if the public continues to be led to believe that a disaster is imminent, no price may be considered too, accepted, too excessive, and there goes another several trillion dollars in another industry falls into government control. Your sheet gives you a website address from the Texas P Public Policy Foundation where you can get details on the reach of the waxman Markey legislation. Government is not capable of running our energy future or any other of our commercial futures. They are not business people. Let me close with just a few examples and a few principles. I mentioned my newspaper boy days at the, offset, this, uh, at the outset this evening. One of the first lessons I learned was that of cash flow. My bills come true, I had to pay for the papers I bought, I needed to get out and collect from my customers for their monthly papers or I had a problem, a cash flow problem. Look at what happened with the cash for clunkers programs. Many auto dealers almost went broke waiting for the government to come up with the $4,500 for each car they sold, thinking that government cash was going to be there. It's my understanding that Ford ended up even bailing out some of its larger dealers. When you can print money, cash flow is not a factor. Recently, the government has announced another stimulus bill wherein appliances will qualify for up to a $300 government rebate. The program is announced to start on or after October 15th. My brother-in-law is an appliance dealer in Southern California. Would anyone care to guess how business is going right now? In essence, the government has shut down the appliance industry for a couple of months. Have you ever heard of any businessman introducing a special sale that will begin in two months? <laughs> it's insane. In bailing out General Motors, the government offered about $60 billion for 60% interest in the company, a $40 billion pre-money valuation, as we say in venture capital. GM's revenue last year was within a percentage of Ford's. Debt load was slightly different between the two companies, but the top mark, but the total market cap of Ford's equity was only 18 billion. Do you think the government overpaid? If comparisons or comparables count, they got a very bad deal for us. Government wants to protect the companies that are too big to fail. Are they aware that every major new industry of the last 50 years, from semiconductors to personal computers to software to the net to biotech, was started by 20-year-olds in startups? Does anyone here believe that GM is going to be the revolutionary of the car industry? I don't. And back to energy, some question, same question. Will Exxon be the innovator? I bet against it. The 20-year-olds will come up with new ideas based on new technology, so why would we want to increase the cost on these startups, forcing them to move overseas to find a competitive environment in which to manufacture? It's crazy. Many more examples could be used, but here are some principles. Government, particularly the federal government, isn't set up to understand the role of business competition. Competition sharpens people and makes them better. It 
probably amazes a lot of politicians that the post office can't seem to beat FedEx and UPS. They don't get it. Government's role is to make the rules. Government is not structured to react to day-to-day -day realities of a market. The whole structure of our government system is to make it deliberative. Business doesn't work that way. Well, not tonight's subject. God help us if they take over health care. The term emergency room will take on a whole new meaning. <laughs> so what, what I want you to do is result in these remarks. First, push your legislation to get back to the fact that America is falling further and further behind in its competitiveness because of the cost of doing business in America. And a large part of that is a spiraling cost of energy. Yes, we must have true, be true to the environment, but the fact is we have been. Now we have to compete. Second, don't buy this carbon stuff at face value. I'm no scientist, but the basis for these conclusions that there is extreme danger to human generated carbon emissions in the form of CO2 is highly speculative and some is pure fabrication of the most scandalous sort. Third, fight the cap and trade and carbon tax ideas as hard as you have fought the healthcare debacle. Why? To bring jobs back to America, we need competitive energy. To fuel the electric cars that are probably in our future, we need competitive energy. Even to solve other problems like further availability of water, we will need even more energy for projects such as desalinization. In summary, we have to get back to our roots. We are competitive people, we need a competitive government, and we need the truth about carbon dioxide. I've heard it said that in stormy weather, the worst person to sit next to on an airplane is a person trained as a pilot. They know too much and will scare the socks off you. Maybe that applies to me as far as Washington is concerned. Maybe I spent too much time there, so maybe I tend to overreaction. But I'm scared to death right now. But I do have confidence in the American spirit and in the American people. They may have gotten it wrong last fall, but with your unflinching help, they won't allow that wrong to ruin this great country. God bless you, and may God bless you.